It was May 30th, 1955, less than a month after the Canadians were eliminated by the Detroit Red Wings in the Stanley Cup, and three days after Jimmy Bartlett's 23rd birthday. Jimmy was at a restaurant in Montreal called Gerachimo's while listening to the ragtime piano song Crazy Otto being played on the jukebox when he ran into Phil Watson, who was Jimmy's nemesis when he was the head coach of the Quebec Citadels during Jimmy's junior hockey career. Phil told Jimmy that he had been named the head coach of the New York Rangers and asked him if he would be interested in playing in New York next season. Jimmy laughed and said, that's impossible, Phil. I'm owned by the Montreal Canadiens. I can't play for New York. But if you can make it happen, I promise I won't disappoint you. Phil smiled, wished him luck and said, I'll see you next year in New York. Jimmy was stunned. He immediately started thinking, New York City, biggest city in America. Images of Times Square and the bright lights of New York City filled his head with excitement. But when he went home that night, he started to have his doubts, thinking that Phil Watson had lied to him and was just playing him for a fool. However, two days later, Jimmy Bartlett bought a newspaper and he couldn't believe his eyes when he read the headlines that the New York Rangers drafted him from the Montreal Canadiens. Phil Watson really did believe in him and wanted him to be a Ranger. Jimmy was surprised that the Montreal organization let him go because Dick Irvin had a lot of praise for his work and they had discussed their plans for Jimmy's role with the team in the upcoming season. However, because of the Richard riot, Dick Irvin was no longer the head coach of the Montreal Canadiens. Kenny Reardon, a player who Jimmy was compared with when he used to be a defenseman, was the head of player development for the Canadiens organization. Reardon thought that Jimmy Bartlett was way too crazy and unpredictable and tried to trade him away back in 1953 when Jimmy was with the Cincinnati Mohawks and then banished him to Matan for a year instead of allowing Jimmy to turn pro. Although Bartlett was disappointed that he wasn't going to be a Canadian, he realized that it was all for the best. Jimmy's friend Donnie Marshall was a scoring machine in Junior and the Cincinnati Mohawks. However, on the Montreal Canadiens, Donnie Marshall played on the third line and was asked just to kill penalties. And that's not what Bartlett wanted to do. He saw his role as hitting people and putting the puck in the back of the net. In other words, he would have a better opportunity to prove himself with the Rangers than he would ever have with the Canadiens. Phil Watson visited Jimmy at his house a couple days later. Phil told Jimmy that he planned on having 16 skaters dressed during the season, and if it was the last thing he'd do, he'd make sure that Bartlett would be one of them. Watson promised that if he reported the training camp in good shape and worked hard during the season, he could easily become a star with the Broadway blue shirts. Jimmy told the press, you can be sure I'll be in top shape for the training season. I'll make the team just watch. In 1993, the Tampa Bay Lightning drafted power forward Chris Gratton with the third pick in the draft. When Bartlett and I used to go to the hockey games to see the Lightning play in the early 1990s, my dad would tell me, don't watch anybody, just watch Gratton. According to Bartlett, Gratton could not stay in position and would waste all of his energy chasing the puck all over the ice, at which point he'd be completely tired and useless until the end of his shift. Forty years earlier, Muzz Patrick, the general manager of the New York Rangers, ironically told the press that although Bartlett was rugged, a strong skater with a good shot who loves to play the game, he would like Jimmy to be able to stay in his own lane. In camp, we're going to paint a line on the ice marking off the left wing alley. Every time Bartlett crosses the line, we'll find him a dollar. Maybe that'll cure him. Right before training camp began in Saskatoon, Jimmy was told by Phil Watson that he was almost sure of making the team, but he'd have to prove it on the ice in training camp and not by his past accomplishments. However, Jimmy showed up at camp out of shape. He wasn't skating well, and his shot was weak and inaccurate. Jimmy was the last player cut that year out of training camp. Instead of playing for the New York Rangers, he would be assigned to the Providence Reds in the American Hockey League. In the 1950s and 1960s, the NHL only had six teams. Barely over 100 players played in the entire league. Although the NHL has always been the most prestigious league in hockey, 
During the 1950s and 60s, the American Hockey League was the undisputed second most prestigious hockey league in the world. In 1955, the AHL, just like the NHL, consisted of only six teams. How good was the AHL? Today, there are 32 teams in the NHL and 16 of them make the playoffs. So not only would all the players and teams from the American Hockey League be in the NHL today, they would all be in the playoffs. Today, the minor leagues primarily exist to serve their master, the NHL, as a developmental farm league of young talent. However, back in the 1950s and 60s, the American Hockey League was fiercely independent and competed against the NHL for talent and prestige. Because of the use of C-forms, the NHL had exclusive rights to most of the young prospects in the talent pool. Because of this, NHL teams reached affiliation agreements with AHL teams to assign them with young prospects who were good enough to play professional but not yet ready for the NHL. However, most of the players on the AHL rosters were actually owned by the AHL teams themselves. These players weren't young kids, but seasoned professional athletes who are no longer controlled by the NHL because the terms of the previously signed C forms had either expired or been voluntarily terminated. Most of these players never really were given an opportunity to shine, even if they were called up for a cup of coffee. Because the NHL was so small and the competition for the roster spots was so competitive, the only chance that a prospect could make an NHL team was if there was a gaping hole and that prospect had the tool set to fill that particular need of that team at that given moment. If a prospect wanted to make it in the NHL, they had to be lucky. They had to be at the right place at the right time. As a result of this, many of the best players of the 1950s and 1960s played for and were owned by teams in the American Hockey League. In 1956, the average salary in the American Hockey League was about $5,000 a year. In the NHL, it was about $7,000 a year. The best player on the planet, Rocket Richard, made only $12,000. Some minor league players preferred to play in the minors instead of the NHL because they would rather be a big fish in a small pond. Some AHL stars actually earned more in salary than NHL players, and established AHL stars could supplement their income with lucrative celebrity endorsements and local commercials. The Providence Reds were one of the original teams in the American Hockey League and began playing in 1926. Despite the official designation as the Providence Reds, locally the team proudly was referred to by its fans as the Rhode Island Reds. Regardless of what they were called, they were definitely the pride of Providence. The team played in one of the oldest skating rinks in America, a big red barn called the Rhode Island Auditorium. Why it was called the Auditorium is unknown because in big white letters on its front was painted the word Arena. The venue was famous for hosting 28 of Rocky Marciano's 49 fights from 1948 to 1952. Many thought that this was the reason why Jimmy got the nickname Rocky, but he had the nickname before he ever came to Providence. Even though the arena only was built to hold 5,500 people, Sunday night hockey at the arena was the highest ticket in town, and about 6,000 fans would cram themselves in like sardines to enjoy their beloved team and would scream enthusiastically as the team would hit the ice to the organist version of the beer barrel polka. The Providence Reds have a very rich history with many of its players enshrined in the American and National League Halls of Fame. The team won the American Hockey League Championship and the Calder Cup in 1938, 1940, and 1949. In 1977, the original Providence franchise relocated and is now the Hartford Wolfpack. In 1992, Providence rejoined the American Hockey League as the Providence Bruins. The Rhode Island Reds Heritage Society was formed to restore and preserve the fabled 51-year history of the Reds from 1926 through 1977. For the last 20 years, the Rhode Island Reds Heritage Society has hosted a reunion weekend for the players alumni up in Providence each August. The Heritage Society and the Rhode Island Hockey Hall of Fame 
are currently working on building a museum to pay perpetual tribute to the Reds in Rhode Island hockey. The general manager of the Reds in 1955 was an Irishman by the name of Terry Reardon, who was the older brother of Kenny Reardon, the guy who previously helped orchestrate Jimmy's departure from the Canadians. As a player, Terry was on the Stanley Cup winning team in 1941 with the Boston Bruins. From 1947 to 1953, Terry was the player coach for the Providence Reds and led them to the Calder Cup title in 1949. However, the pinnacle of Reardon's career took place in the 1955-56 season. As the team's general manager, Reardon put together a team for the ages. According to the Society for International Hockey Research, the 1955-56 Providence Reds was the greatest minor league hockey team in the history of the sport. The general consensus is that if they were permitted to play in the National Hockey League, they would not have finished last and probably would have made the playoffs ahead of Boston, Toronto, and Chicago. After finishing dead last the year before, the Providence Reds under their new coach, Johnny Crawford, won 45 times in 64 games. Johnny Crawford was previously an NHL All-Star defenseman who played his entire career with the Boston Bruins and won two Stanley Cups with them. Crawford remained the Reds coach for the rest of the 1950s and is still in the top 10 for games coach in the history of the AHL. In 1973, when he was the general manager of the Cape Cod Cubs of the Eastern Hockey League, he collapsed during a game and died at the age of 56. To say that the 1955-56 Providence Reds was loaded with talent is an understatement. The undisputed superstar of the Reds was a right winger by the name of Zelio Topazzini, nicknamed Topper. Topper made his NHL debut for the Boston Brewers at the young age of 19, but was given barely any ice time. When he was 21, he was traded to the Rangers and scored 14 goals in only 55 games. However, the next season, for whatever reason, the Rangers traded Topazzini to the Providence Reds, where he played the rest of his career, retiring in 1964. Topper is the all-time leading scorer in Reds history in both the regular season and the playoffs. On April 1st, 2000, the Rhode Island Reds Heritage Society honored Zelio Topper Topazzini as the Reds Player of the Century. Topper was inducted into the American Hockey League Hall of Fame in 2012 and ranks 13th on the AHL's all-time scoring list. Zelio's younger brother, Jerry Topazzini, was also a hockey player who played for the Boston Bruins between 1952 and 1964. Jerry, also nicknamed Topper, was a skilled defensive specialist and penalty killer who set the record in the NHL for short-handed goals in a season in 1958. Although, although younger brother Jerry had a lengthy and successful NHL career, while Zelio toiled in the less prestigious American Hockey League, Many, if not most, of the New England hockey fans of the day treated Zelio as a bigger star than his younger brother. In the 1955-56 season, Topazzini led the AHL with 113 points while scoring 42 goals. Playing on the same line as Topper was the mild-mannered, slick puck-handling center named Paul Larravee who had 80 points and 27 goals. Paul Larravee is the second all-time point scorer and goal scorer and assist leader in the history of the Providence Red, where he starred from 1952 to 1962. Although he never played in the NHL, Paul Larravee, after he retired for 20 years, served as the color commentator for French radio and television broadcasts of the Montreal Canadiens. At left wing on Topper's line was Camille Henry, nicknamed the Eel. Camille Henry was Phil Watson's star player with the Quebec Citadels during Jimmy's last year in junior hockey. He led the Quebec Junior Hockey League with 114 points and 52 goals. In 1953, Camille Henry scored 24 goals for the New York Rangers and was named the NHL's Rookie of the Year. However, because Camille Henry was only 5'7 and weighed 150 pounds while soaking wet, the Rangers management thought that he was too small and frail to play in the NHL. So despite being a goal scoring machine and winning the rookie of the year, the Rangers assigned him the next year to the American Hockey League. During the Reds 55-56 historical season,
Camille Henry scored 50 goals and 91 points on the line with Topper and Larravee. Two seasons later, Camille Henry rejoined the Rangers and enjoyed seven seasons where he scored more than 20 goals and twice scored more than 30 goals. The captain of the Reds was red-headed veteran defenseman Andy Brannigan, who was named second team All-Star at the end of the season. Before joining the Reds in 1954, Brannigan played eight years for the Hershey Bears, where he won the Calder Cup in 1946. Brannigan is 15th all-time in games played in AHL history. Also joining the Reds in 1955 was defenseman George McAvoy, who played for the Reds for three years before moving on to the Cleveland Barons and then later the Calgary Stampeders in the Western Hockey League. McAvoy was briefly Jimmy's teammate in 1951 when they both played for the Boston Olympics together. Also on defense was Aldo Gwidelin. Aldo was a forward in junior, but was converted over to defense by the New York Rangers when he joined the team in 1952. Aldo Gwidelin played for the Providence Reds for three years beginning 1955 before eventually moving on to the Cleveland Barons and then the Baltimore Clippers. The well-respected Gwidelin eventually became an NHL scout for the Atlanta Flames and became the director of player development for the Colorado Rockies as well as coaching both in the NHL and the AHL. Tall center Ray Ross won back-to-back -back Calder Cups for the Cleveland Barons in 1952 and 53 before starting a seven-year stint with the Reds beginning in 1954. Rookie phenom Bruce Klein scored 27 goals for the 55-56 Reds that year. In 13 seasons in the American Hockey League, Bruce Klein was one of the biggest scorers and scored 20 goals eight times and 30 goals three times. After leaving the Reds, Bruce Klein would eventually win the Calder Cup three years in a row for the Springfield Indians, before playing for the Hershey Bears for five years and retiring in 1968, before being inducted into the American Hockey League Hall of Fame in 2016. Although Topper led the league in scoring, he was not the MVP. Instead, the MVP went to the goalie for the Providence Reds, the great Johnny Bauer who is the undisputed greatest goalie in the history of the AHL. To this day, whenever a goalie successfully poke checks a player on a breakaway, the announcer invariably brings up Johnny Bauer's name as the inventor of the poke check. Johnny Bauer began playing for the Cleveland Barons in 1945 until 1953, while winning numerous goalie awards and three Calder Cup championships. The Barons sold him to the New York Rangers where he played for a season before they sent him back to the American League. Johnny Bauer was back-to-back -back MVP for both 55-56 and 56-57 with the Reds before the Rangers sold him back again to the Cleveland Barons when he was named MVP of the American Hockey League for the third consecutive season. At the ripe old age of 34, the Toronto Maple Leafs called up Johnny Bauer and made him their starting goaltender. As a member of the Leafs, Johnny Bauer led the league in save percentage six times and goals against average three times, while leading the Toronto Maple Leafs in the early 60s to three consecutive Stanley Cup victories. In 1967, at the age of 42, Johnny Bauer was the starting goaltender for Toronto Maple Leafs' fourth Stanley Cup victory in the 60s and the last time they ever won it in the history of their franchise. Jimmy Bartlett was able to get the Providence fans to chant the name Rocky before the season even began. In an exhibition game, Arnie Colbin of the Hershey Bears who was known throughout the league for his ability to elbow, shove, and push without being caught by the referees, jostled Bartlett near the boards. Before the Providence fans could even get out of their seats, Jimmy, while using the skills developed fighting golden gloves earlier in his life in Montreal, ripped off his hockey gloves and sent Coleman to the ice with the looping right hand. Coleman, his face smeared with blood, was taken to the dressing room for numerous stitches. According to the Providence Journal, Jimmy, who was no longer just a skinny kid, but was now a muscular 180-pound heavyweight himself, decked Arnie Colmer faster than Rocky Marciano did away with Jersey Joe Walcott in their second fight. According to Rocky, I hate being pushed around, and when someone tries, I just throw off the gloves and start swinging. The first game of the regular season took place on October 8, 1955 in Hershey. 
At the 8.36 mark of the first period, Jimmy, while playing on a line with fellow rookies Ron Atwell and Bruce Klein, who both got assists, beat Hershey goalie John Henderson for the very first goal of Jimmy's AHL career. During the 55-56 season, the Providence Reds and the Pittsburgh Hornets easily dominated the rest of the league and the two teams were neck and neck all season. The Hornets were led by the great Willie Marshall, who was second in the league that year in scoring only to topper. Willie Marshall holds the all-time records for most goals, most points, most assists, most hat tricks, and most games played in the history of the American Hockey League. The Willie Marshall Award, which is awarded to the AHL's leading goal scorer, is named after him. Sadly, despite scoring 523 goals in the AHL during his 20-year career, none of the NHL teams were interested in him. And in his career, he only scored one goal in the National Hockey League. Simply put, Willie Marshall was born at the wrong time. If he played hockey today, he'd probably make about $7 million a year. From 1948 to 1955, Frank Mathers was the star defenseman for the Pittsburgh Hornets and was named first team All-Star five years in a row. After announcing his retirement so he can go back to dental school at the end of the season, the president of the Hershey Bears convinced Mathers to sign with the Bears as a player coach after taking him to Hershey Park and riding roller coasters with him and his wife. Although Mathers retired from playing at the end of the 1961 season, he stayed as a coach and general manager of the Hershey Bears until 1988 and was eventually inducted into both the NHL and AHL Hall of Fames. Between the pipes, Pittsburgh also had Hall of Fame goalie Gil Mayer. Although he was nicknamed the Needle because he was only five foot six and weighed about 135 pounds, making him about the smallest player in the league, his lightning quick reflexes made him a hell of a goalie and he led the league in goals against for the Pittsburgh Hornets for four consecutive years while winning the Calder Cup in 1952 and 1955. The defending champion Pittsburgh Hornets met up with Providence that year for the first time on October 16th. While trailing 5-2 midway in the third period, the Hornets scored three goals in approximately two minutes to tie up the game at 5-all and send it to overtime. After defenseman Camille Bedard sent Jimmy a long pass from the blue line, rookie Rocky Bartlett beat Gil Mayer with the winning overtime goal. On October 23, 1955, Jimmy had his very first multi-goal game in the American Hockey League. Bartlett and Topper each scored two goals against Donnie Simmons, and Johnny Bauer had his first shutout of the season in a 5-0 victory against the Springfield Indians. Hershey and Providence played a wild game on October 30th, 1955. As a result of high sticks to the face, Ed Krasnowski of the Bears lost two teeth, and Stan Parker of Hershey had a broken nose. In the second period, Jimmy was knocked out when both he and Don Cherry slid against the boards together, Bartlett in front. He struck his head against the boards and laid there, unconscious as play switched to the other end of the rink. In the third period, the lights went out as the Rhode Island Auditorium suffered a power failure. When the lights came back on, a patched up, rejuvenated Jimmy Bartlett and Hershey's Don Cherry entertained the fans with the big hockey fight. Don Cherry was a defenseman who played from 1954 to 1972 for the Bears, the Springfield Indians, and the Rochester Amherst, and was later inducted into the AHL Hall of Fame. After he retired from playing, Don Cherry coached the big bad Boston Bruins in the 1970s. However, Don Cherry is most famous for hosting a segment during Hockey Night in Canada called Coach's Corner from 1986 to 2019 that made him a phenomenon in Canada. The extremely colorful Don Cherry was known for his politically incorrect and extremely controversial opinions and for wearing flamboyant, flashy suits. One of hockey's all-time greatest characters, his life story was dramatized in two separate films made by the CBC. At one time, Don Cherry was so popular that in 2004, a poll of the most popular Canadian citizen of all time, Don Cherry came in seventh. Much of Cherry's popularity was due to his criticism of modern hockey. 
with its emphasis on speed and skill instead of physical play. Instead, Cherry was a strong advocate of the warrior code and that fighting enforces respect between teams and players in the league. After receiving years of criticism for his beliefs rooted in right-wing populism, Don Cherry was fired by Hockey Night in Canada in 2019 after making comments that were labeled racist and anti-immigrant. Don Cherry wrote about his 1955 fight with Jimmy Bartlett in his autobiography, Grapes. On my very first shift, I ran into a character named Jimmy Bartlett, a real tough kid off the streets of Montreal who could really throw them. Bartlett had just run over one of our more timid players and I figured it was time I protected my own. Bartlett didn't kill me, but he definitely took the decision. After I returned to the bench, my timid teammate, who couldn't have beaten his grandmother in a one-on-one, -on -one, said to me very disparagingly, Geez, Don, I was surprised you let Bartlett take you. Can you believe that? Here's a guy who needs me to protect him, and I obliged even though my foot was killing me and I hadn't skated in six weeks, and he gives me this crap about losing the fight. I am certain that goalie for the Pittsburgh Hornets, Gil Mayer, did not enjoy playing against Jimmy Bartlett on November 6, 1955. Jimmy scored two goals in the second period in the Reds' 5-1 victory. However, to make matters worse, with a minute left of the game, Jimmy Bartlett, looking for the hat trick, fired a shot that hit Gil Mayer in the face. With the ice in front of the net covered in his blood, Gil Mayer had to be removed from the ice after suffering a broken nose and a severely swollen and closed left eye. On November 24th, the Providence Reds scored three goals in the final period to beat the Springfield Indians 4-1. Jimmy had two of those third period goals and did his famous Irish jig dance to celebrate his second goal. The day that Jimmy Bartlett became a star in Providence probably dates to November 27, 1955, in the game against the Cleveland Barons in which Jimmy Bartlett had his very first AHL career hat trick. According to the Providence Journal, the spectators that night were rocking with jubilation. The spectators also rocked at the tremendous three-goal achievement of Jim Bartlett, the fiery rookie left wing who already has become one of the circuit's ablest and most discussed players. Bartlett was really winging and there was a dramatic touch to each of his tallies. This lad has flair. He reaches the crowd with his personality as well as his dynamic play. The enthusiasm he showed after each of his tallies, mounting with each one, spread to the stands. The spectators shared in his merriment as he raised his stick over his head in signaling each of his goals. He narrowly missed making it six on three fine opportunities in the finale. The use of the word rock to describe the reaction of the fans in that article isn't a coincidence. America at the time was at the beginning of a great cultural revolution. When Jimmy was playing in Montreal and Jakutami a year before, the biggest musical stars in the country were Eddie Fisher, Doris Day, Perry Como, and Rosemary Clooney. But surely before the 55-56 season began, a novelty record called Rock Around the Clock became a national sensation. When Jimmy was enjoying his rookie season in Providence, a young guy from Tupelo, Mississippi was making his first rock and roll recordings. American icons like John Wayne and Douglas MacArthur were being replaced by younger heroes like Marlon Brando, James Dean, and Elvis Presley. The new American heroes were young, exciting, slightly dangerous, non-conforming rebels. Words that perfectly describe the 23-year-old rookie for Providence. By December of 1955, Jimmy was tied for the league in goals scored in the American Hockey League. The press speculated that if Bartlett could maintain his early pace, he would rank with the outstanding first-year men in league history. This never happened, however, because in December 1955, Jimmy and Aldo Gwydalin were called up to play for the New York Rangers. Jimmy made his debut for the New York Rangers on December 18, 1955. Jimmy had been dating a local Providence girl named Helen Daniels, 
who were driven by the Gwendolens to New York so she could be with her boyfriend. Hockey's greatest historian, Stan Fischler, advised Ranger fans to fasten their safety belts. The atomic age Bill as a Nicky has arrived. A player rough, tough, and fearless. Phil Watson wanted a hard-hitting brawler, not afraid to mix it up, and that's exactly what he was going to get. On Christmas Day, the Rangers played Jimmy's old team, the Montreal Canadiens, for the first time. In the second period, Bernie Jeffreyon was giving a two-minute minor for high-sticking against Bartlett. While Jeffreyon was being put in the penalty box, Jimmy, inspired by Killer Kowalski, whispered in Jeffreyon's ear, Next time you come at me with a stick, I'll take your fucking ear off. Once he was in the penalty box, Jeffrey on threw his stick across the ice at the referee and was given a 10-minute misconduct. Jimmy then skated by the penalty box and taunted Jeffrey on with a tough guy, huh? Boom, boom. You're not so tough when that door's not closed. At which point, Jeffrey on took off his right glove and threw it at Jimmy on the ice and started screaming at him in French. Butch Bouchard had to skate over to talk to Boom Boom in French in order to calm him down to avoid being kicked out of the game. Later in the game, Bartlett and Rocket Richard tangled with each other against the end boards. After being hooked by Bartlett, Rocket told Jimmy, you're asking for a fight, and Bartlett said, okay, I'm right here, I'm not going anywhere, at which point Richard backed down. On New Year's Day, 1956, the Rangers defeated the Boston Bruins at the Boston Garden 4-2. At 4.53 of the third period, winger Danny Lewicki of the New York Rangers scored a goal against the great Terry Salchuk with assists by Jimmy Bartlett and Lou Fontenato. It was the very first NHL point of Jimmy Bartlett's career. Jimmy and Gwidlin stayed with the Rangers until January 21st for a total of 12 games. Jimmy and Aldo did not receive much playing time, and just like Donnie Marshall in the Canadiens organization, Jimmy was used primarily to kill penalties while picking up a few shifts playing with Bronco Horvath and Danny Lewicki. Although Jimmy only scored that one point during his 12 games with the Rangers, the team had a record of 7-4-1 during his stay, while posting a losing record for the rest of the season. At the end of January 1956, Jimmy and Gwendolyn rejoined the Providence Reds and helped them win the last 19 of their 25 games. Jimmy Bartlett's goal in the January 29th victory against the Cleveland Barons was described by the Providence Journal as being a result of Jimmy's brilliant individual effort. He gathered a loose puck in the neutral zone rushed down the left lane, and then fired a blistering 12-footer into the right corner that was the shot of the night. However, after scoring the goal, Jimmy spun around and while doing his famous victory dance around the ice, accidentally crashed into the boards head first, knocking himself unconscious. Jimmy was the big hero in the March 11th game against Buffalo. After getting an unassisted goal, in the second period which tied the score three to three. After racing over the blue line, Jimmy blasted a terrific shot from 50 feet out that won the game in overtime. Jimmy, taking a pass from Bob Robertson, fired his sizzling left-hander just when goalie Hank Basson must certainly have expected him to come in much closer. Jimmy, jubilant, went roaring ahead and wound up clinging gloriously to the top of the screen behind the cage for his victory celebration. This time, he did not knock himself out. Because of the Reds' historical season, they secured home ice advantage throughout the playoffs. Jimmy ended his remarkable rookie AHL season with 28 goals. In the first round, the Reds were matched up against the Buffalo Bisons. The leading scorer of Buffalo was Kenny Wareham, a right winger who later starred for 11 seasons with the Chicago Blackhawks, playing on the same line with Stan Mikita and Bobby Hall. Center Larry Wilson led the Buffalo Bisons with 39 goals that year. Wilson played for Buffalo from 1955 until 1968 and would become the franchise's all-time leader in every offensive category. In 2011, Larry Wilson was inducted into the AHL Hall of Fame. His son, Ron Wilson, in the 2000s became a very successful NHL coach and coached for 18 seasons. In the first game of the five-game series, Jimmy converted a pass from Aldo Gwidlin and scored the first goal of the game, which resulted in a 5-1 victory for the Reds. Although dropping game two, 
The Reds blew out Buffalo 8-2 in Game 3, in which Jimmy got another goal. Bartlett was the GOAT in Buffalo's 4-1 victory, which tied the series at two games apiece that took place on April Fool's Day. Jimmy drew a stupid, high-sticking penalty, which resulted in the game's winning power play goal. Jimmy was also penalized for not one, but two fights against Bison's left winger, Jack McIntyre. At one time during the game, Bartlett also got into some sort of jam with spectators behind the Buffalo bench. In the third period, Aldo Gwydlin and goalie Hank Basson created a fight which emptied both benches and turned into an all-out brawl in which everybody on both teams participated except for Johnny Bauer. In Game 5, Paul Larravee and Topper both scored in the first minute of the game and the team never looked back as the Reds eliminated the Buffalo 6-3. Although Bartlett did not score, the press noted that Jimmy Bartlett, whose belligerence had cost the Reds manpower in the previous game, played his best in a long time and curbing his temper admirably didn't retaliate at all, even though three Buffalo penalties were levied because of fouls against Jimmy Bartlett. In the finals, Providence played the Cleveland Barons who had upset the Pittsburgh Hornets. Cleveland was led by their superstar, Fred Glover, who had led the American League eight times in his career in scoring. When Fred Glover retired in 1968, he was the American Hockey League's all-time leader in games played, goals, assists, points, and penalty minutes. At the time of his retirement, only Gordy Howe and Rocket Richard had scored more goals in professional hockey. During his career, Glover was MVP three times and won the Calder Cup championship five times. Although Willie Marshall would eventually break his scoring records, Fred Glover still remains the American Hockey League's greatest forward. At defense, Cleveland had perennial all-star Steve Kravchak who began playing for the Cleveland Barons in 1949 and retired with the Providence Reds in 1964. When he retired, he was the all-time leading scoring defenseman in the AHL, a distinction that he held for more than 40 years. It was time to roll out the barrels when the Reds outscored the Barons 13-3 to start off the first two playoff games at home. Topper scored two goals in the Reds' 6-1 Game 1 victory and the Eels scored twice in Providence's 7-2 win in Game 2. Providence won Game 3, 4-2 in Cleveland, despite Paul Larravee breaking his hand during the game. In Game 4, Fred Glover gave the Cleveland Barons a 1-0 lead in the second period. However, at 8.05, George McAvoy made a beautiful long pass to Jimmy Bartlett in the neutral zone. Jimmy continued down the left lane with only defenseman Tommy Williams in his way. Williams backed up trying to block Bartlett's shot, but Jimmy's speed prevailed. He slipped behind Williams and fired the 25-foot tying goal into the net. This started a goal-scoring spree led by Camille Henry's four-goal effort, with Providence winning the game 6-3 and sweeping the Cleveland Barons in four games to win the 1956 Calder Cup Championship. At the end of the season, Bruce Klein was voted the American League's Rookie of the Year, defeating his teammate Jimmy Bartlett, who had missed a month of the season due to his call-up in December by the New York Rangers. Unlike most hockey players who returned to Canada during the offseason, Jimmy remained in Rhode Island with his girlfriend Helen and made Providence his home. Jimmy never went back to live in Canada, but instead became a permanent resident of the United States for the rest of his life. Jimmy maintained his Canadian citizenship, but had a green card for more than 60 years. The reason why he never became a citizen was he was afraid of the embarrassment that would occur if he failed the citizenship test. However, Jimmy knew a lot more about American history and the United States Constitution than the typical American knows about Canadian history. I mean, how many Americans know that Sir John MacDonald was the first Prime Minister of Canada or that Tommy Douglas gave the people universal health care? In the fall, Jimmy once again attended training camp with the hope of making the New York Rangers. Just like the year before when he showed up for training camp out of shape, Jimmy again blew his chance. 
Skating with a lackadaisical, couldn't care less attitude, Jimmy disappointed Phil Watson once again and was reassigned to the Providence Reds for the 1956-57 season. At the beginning of the 1956-57 season, the Pittsburgh Hornets relocated their franchise to Rochester, where they were renamed the Rochester Americans, nicknamed the Amerix for short, with star players Willie Marshall and Frank Mathers departing the team for Hershey. On October 20th, 1956, a loss in Cleveland by Providence almost turned into a riot. According to coach Johnny Crawford, a group of spectators were needling and bothering the Providence players in the team's bench all through the game. A scuffle ensued after the game was over when a fan attempted to yank a hockey stick from one of the Providence players. As a result of the incident, one of the spectators claimed that he was attacked by Jimmy Bartlett and filed a lawsuit against Bartlett, Johnny Crawford, and the Providence Reds hockey team for damages. Three years later, Johnny Crawford and Jimmy Bartlett had to appear for the jury trial because the press never reported on the outcome of the trial, the case was probably either dismissed or settled outside of court. The 1956 American Hockey League All-Star Game pitted an All-Star team against the defending Providence Reds champions. Jimmy Bartlett scored the very first goal of the game and Johnny Bauer stopped 47 shots in a brilliant 4 to nothing shutout by the Providence Reds against the American Hockey League All-Star team. The 1956-57 season was a three-team race between Providence, Rochester, and Cleveland. The defending champions were not as strong as they were the year before, and Providence won 11 fewer games than they did when they won the championship. Topper had a huge drop in production and scored only 13 goals and 53 points. Because he was called up to play 30 games with the Rangers, Bruce Klein, former Rookie of the Year, was limited to only 36 games that season for the Reds. Providence's top scorer that year was Paul Larravee, who led the American League with 46 goals and was third in scoring with 89 points behind Fred Glover and Willie Marshall. Camille Henry went on an unbelievable scoring spree and scored 31 goals in only 29 games. As a result, in January, he was called up by the Rangers and he never ever played another game as a Providence Red. Prior to their game against the Hershey Bears on December 9th, the Reds record was a mediocre 11-9-3. One of the major reasons for Providence's mediocre start of the season was the continued poor play of Jimmy Bartlett. With only three goals in the first two months of the season, Stan Fischler, the hockey historian, wrote that the Blase Bartlett was one of the worst Providence forwards through October and November. Rocky had an explanation for his poor play. Just like the Johnstown Chiefs at the end of Slapshot, who abandoned roughhouse tactics in their final game, to the disappointment of their fans and the bewilderment of Struther Martin, Jimmy had allowed the critics to get inside of his head and convince him that the best way to make the New York Rangers was to avoid taking penalties by curbing his aggressive, hard-hitting style. This overly cautious and conservative style of play negatively impacted Jimmy's goal production as well as he overthought his actions every time he hit the ice. By December, the old Rocky was back, scoring goals and pulverizing the opposition with reckless abandonment. Bartlett told Fischler, I'll be back in New York. Maybe not this year, but next season for sure. You wait and see. Playing his best game of the season, Jimmy Bartlett scored a goal and had two assists in the Red 7-4 victory against the Bears. This victory was the beginning of a seven-game winning streak by the Providence Reds, which secured them first place. During that streak, Jimmy scored two goals in a game against Springfield in which Paul Larravee notched his 100th goal of his career. A week later, Jimmy added two more goals in the Reds' ninth consecutive home victory against Cleveland. At the end of January, the Reds went on a four-game winning streak. In the January 26th game against Buffalo, Jimmy scored two goals in the first 34 seconds of the game. According to the Providence Journal, in the second period, Jimmy engaged in a fierce stick-swinging duel with Tony Schneider of the Buffalo Bisons that had the crowd of 51-56 
both frenzied and fretful at the possible consequences. The angered lads swung their sticks with such ferocity that they may have been seriously injured had either landed. After concluding their clubbing, they dropped the lumber and started tossing punches. Finally, this subsided and were banished for five minutes with major penalties. Because of a completely shut injured eye and a lacerated ear, Tony Schneider's injuries prevented him from playing the next couple of games for Buffalo. On February 1st, in a tied game one-to-one -one against the Rochester Americans, Jimmy took a shot from the blue line, got his own rebound, and scored the game-winning third-period goal against Bobby Perot of the Rochester Amherst for the Reds' fourth win in a row. According to the press, Jimmy Bartlett, the fiery left winger, who was the league's most penalized forward, has been a big gun in the team's new run of triumphs. The mercurial Jim, who is as fast with his fists as Cheyenne is with his gun, has found the range as a sniper for the Reds and figures to be a big asset to the Providence team in the stretch drive of the American Hockey League race. On March 3rd, 1957, with the score tied 3-3 against the Cleveland Barons, Jimmy Bartlett made a spectacular dash down the left lane after taking a pass from defenseman George McAvoy. He then cut sharply to the right in breaking loose from a Cleveland defenseman and fired a shot in overtime that gave the Reds a 4-3 victory and enabled them to retain their slim lead in the American Hockey League race. Most of Providence's success can be attributed to their brilliant goalie, Johnny Bauer, who once again repeated as the league MVP. On March 10th against the Rochester Amherst, number seven for the Providence Reds scored the seventh goal of the game in a seven to nothing blowout victory. In that game, Johnny Bauer became the all-time shutout king of the American Hockey League by registering his 37th career shutout. On March 23rd, 1957, during the last weekend of the season, with the Reds already clinching first place in the American Hockey League, the last place Indians humiliated Providence in Springfield 11-4. With 30 seconds left of the game, an incident occurred that was the most notorious moment in Jimmy Bartlett's long hockey career. Jimmy was being heckled by a fan named Richard Van Orman when he retaliated by allegedly smacking Richard Van Orman several times on the head, face, and back with his hockey stick. Van Orman was rushed to the emergency room for treatment and released after receiving six stitches to his cracked open scalp. A riot occurred when fans started throwing eggs and other objects at the players on the ice and then later stoned the Providence Reds team bus and smashed windows in the dressing and locker rooms. The police were needed to escort the team bus to the police station as the bus was pursued by about a dozen carloads of angry fans. Here's what Jimmy Bartlett and Ray Ross had to say about that night. It was kind of a funny situation, yet it wasn't a funny situation. We played in Springfield one night against Eddie Shore's team, and uh, Jimmy Bartlett at the time, he got into a ruckus there. They had the chicken wire going around that. <clears throat> and the guy was really after me, and. One of their defensemen pushed me up against the wall and he put a cigarette up to my face. And so when he did that, I went around and jumped over the stance and went over to him and, and threw a lot of shots at him. And we, we practically start, he practically started a, a riot. I really nailed him five, six times. Really nailed him. So then I get back onto the ice again and the fans went crazy. So they, we all gathered up in center ice. And we had to have the police uh, take us out of the rink. And they were throwing all kinds of stuff at us. And when we went into the dressing room, Eddie Shore turned off the hot water. And we had a shower in cold water. So then when I was ready to leave the room, Five or six police officers were there to arrest me for beating up this guy. So they 
The bus driver said he has to drive me to the police station. The bus had to pull up close to the rink to get out because get out, the fans were going crazy trying to get Jimmy throwing stuff at the bus and at the players and whatever. So they took me out of the bus, took me into the police station and arrested me. In that interview, which took place about 50 years after the event, Jimmy got some of the details wrong. And he confused some of the facts with an incident that occurred a year later in Buffalo. Jimmy was never burned by a cigarette by the fan in Springfield, and Jimmy never left the ice to go into the stands to beat the hell out of him. Instead, Jimmy cracked the guy's head open with his hockey stick after he allegedly was sucker punched from behind by the fan while he had his back against the boards. This explanation is completely plausible due to the fact that only chicken wire separated the players from the fans and it was common for the players to get victimized by having beer thrown on them and being spit upon by the fans. The next month, Jimmy had to go to court and he entered a plea of no contest to the criminal charge of assault and battery and was sentenced by the judge to a $100 fine. If this same incident occurred today, Jimmy would be convicted of a felony of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. And if he were lucky enough to avoid escaping a prison sentence, he probably could not avoid being deported back to Canada. The injured fan, Richard Van Orman, filed a lawsuit against Bartlett. However, because he passed away in a car accident, the case was dismissed before it could ever go to trial. At the end of the season, the Providence Reds once again finished in first place and secured home ice for the playoffs. Despite a horrible start at the beginning of the season, Jimmy came back strong during the second half and ended up with 21 goals, fourth best on the team. In the first round, the Reds were matched up against the Rochester Americans, who were led by their star forward, Bronco Horvath, who finished fifth in the league in scoring that year. Bronco and Jimmy played together on the same line the year before during Jimmy's brief stint with the Rangers. At the end of the previous season, Horvath was sold by the Rangers to the Canadians who then assigned him to the Rochester team, where he played for nine seasons before eventually retiring in 1970. Bronco Horvath is most famous for his four-year stint with the Boston Bruins, where he played on the famous Uke line with fellow Ukrainian Canadians, Johnny Busick and Vic Stasiuk when he led the National Hockey League in goals during the 1959-60 season. Bronco would eventually win three Calder Cups with the Rochester Amherst before being inducted into the American Hockey League Hall of Fame in 2015. Goalies Bobby Perot and Johnny Bauer put on the clinic in game one of the playoffs. Holding on to a one to nothing lead in the third period, Jimmy Bartlett fired a shot on Perot, which he saved, but lost control of the rebound which was slammed in by Aldo Gwidelin for the tying goal of the game. However, when the referee disallowed the goal, the Providence general manager, Terry Reardon, stormed from the press box, threaded his way through the crowd, and jumped on the ice where he chased the referee around, screaming in his face, waving his arms violently, and calling the referee every vulgar name in the book. Of course, the referee did not overturn his decision. Terry Reardon was fined $100, and the team lost game one, one to nothing. As the game came to a close, Jimmy Bartlett and Noel Price of Rochester got into a huge fight, which resulted in a bench clearing free for all. Two days later, the Providence Reds were again shut out at home by Rochester's brilliant Bobby Perot. Providence's offense finally came alive in game three playing in Rochester. Bruce Klein was the hero of the game, scoring the winning goal with four minutes remaining to give the Reds a 4-3 victory. Unfortunately, Providence could not take advantage of the momentum and Rochester easily won game five at home, 5-1. Back in Providence for game six, the Reds were down 3-1 in the second period. When Jimmy tried to spark the team by engaging in fisticuffs with Rochester's Ron Hurst. In the third period, however, Rochester scored again, and for all intents and purposes, that was the hockey game. But Bartlett gave the diehard Providence fans a faint glimmer of hope at 11.02 when he scored on a 20-foot backhander on a pass from defenseman Ivan Irwin. Unfortunately, it was too little too late, and the Providence Red season was over. In 1957, there was a global pandemic of the Asian flu. Between one and four million people around the world died from it, making it one of the deadliest pandemics in history. 
Jimmy's dream of joining the New York Rangers was once again crushed because instead of impressing Phil Watson at training camp, Jimmy was home sick in bed with the flu. Bartlett wasn't the only one. The entire Reds roster was devastated. When the season began, so many members of the roster were in bed sick with the flu. Reardon and Crawford had to sign a few amateur players to temporary contracts just to field a roster to avoid forfeiting. By some miracle, this ragtag group was able to win the first four games of the season for the Reds. As soon as young Rocky recovered from the flu, he got hit with the case of tonsillitis, which prevented him from rejoining the Reds until November. Prior to the beginning of the season, the New York Rangers dealt the Reds a devastating blow when for some unknown reason, the New York Rangers decided to sell Johnny Bauer, the team's best player, to the Cleveland Barons. In his place, the Reds platooned two goalies, Marcel Paillé and Gump Worsley, who split duties between the Reds and the New York Rangers that year. Paillé, of course, was Jimmy's teammate when he played for Chicoutimi. Gump would eventually win four Stanley Cups with the Montreal Canadiens and would be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1980. On a positive side, the team added a rookie named Bill Sweeney, who led the team in scoring and was the AHL's Rookie of the Year. Although he only played one year for Providence, Sweeney eventually went to the Springfield Indians where he starred for nine seasons, winning three consecutive Calder Cups and led the league in scoring three years in a row before being inducted into the AHL Hall of Fame in 2010. When I was a kid growing up in the 1970s, I remember my dad whistling a particular melody over and over again. La la di da di da, la da, la da da da. When my mom and I would ask him, what's the name of that song? He had no idea. We couldn't believe our ears when we actually heard it played on the radio one day. This Spanish ballad was actually a number one hit for Jimmy Dorsey back in 1941 and an instrumental remake hit number six in the pop charts in 1963. When my mom learned that the name of the song was Maria Elena, she was a little pissed because during the 1957-58 season, Jimmy's girlfriend, Helen Marie Daniels, became Helen Marie Bartlett. Rocky played his first game of the season after suffering from the flu and tonsillitis on November 3rd, 1957 against the Cleveland Barons. Jimmy had no problem finding his scoring touch as he beat his old friend Johnny Boward for two goals in the second period. In the third period, the Reds' Bob Robertson and Cleveland's Freddie Glover started a brawl which cleared both benches, including Rocky Bartlett who got a misconduct. In December, Jimmy and a couple other members of the Reds took ballet lessons from ballerina Judith Maxwell on the television show called The World Around Us Program in a light-hearted, amusing attempt to make them more graceful on the ice, especially for Bartlett, who was already famous for his dance moves every time he scored a goal. Head coach Crawford and general manager Reardon were big fans, being a couple of Irishmen who thought it resembled the Irish jig. Even team owner Lou Pieri was a big fan of the dance moves of one of the most colorful characters in the long history of the club. Jimmy's new dance lesson certainly came handy on January 5, 1958, in a game against the Rochester Americans that resulted in Jimmy's most memorable moment of his long career. Before the game began, a Catholic priest who was a big fan of the Reds gave Jimmy a blessing and told him that he would get three goals that game. With the score tied 1-1 one one in the first period, Jimmy blasted a 30-footer past goaltender Jerry McNeil for his first goal of the game at 13:26. Then, breaking fast on the ensuing faceoff, Bartlett fired a 45-footer while skating at top speed that found the back of the net at 13:31. a mere five seconds later. Bartlett's two goals in five seconds tied an American Hockey League record, which to this day has still never been broken. For more than 60 years, Bartlett's name has remained in the record books. In the dressing room between the first and second periods, teammate Buck Davies of the Reds said to Jimmy, Hey Jim, you got two goals on your forehand shot. How about giving them a sample of your backhand? 
Jimmy accepted the challenge, and in the second period at 632, Bartlett blasted a 25-foot backhander for his third consecutive goal of the game and a natural hat trick. After doing his famous post-celebration dance for the third time, Jimmy then skated over to the Catholic priest sitting in the first row and shook his hand in appreciation for blessing his stick. By this time in the game, the fans were going absolutely nuts every time Bartlett touched the puck. The Providence fans raised the roof of the arena in the third period when Jimmy scored his fourth goal of the night in the Reds' 7-2 victory. On January 19, 1958, while playing in Buffalo, a third period brawl broke out between Bob Robertson of the Reds and Larry Wilson of the Bisons. While Jimmy's back was against the boards, a Buffalo fan burned him with a cigarette. This then caused an enraged Bartlett to leave the ice and go into the stands after the fan, who we beat the hell out of. This is the incident that Jimmy accidentally conflated with the events in Springfield that resulted in his arrest. Although the Buffalo police needed to intervene, this time Jimmy was not arrested. Because this was the third violent interaction between Jimmy and fans, many were calling for the league to suspend Bartlett. American Hockey League president Richard Canning refused to issue a suspension because he felt that it would unfairly influence the civil suits that were pending against Bartlett in Cleveland and Springfield. Jimmy was once again the big hero on February 23, 1958 in Providence's 7-3 victory against the Hershey Bears at home. In the first period, Bartlett beat goaltender Bob Perot for the first goal of the game with assists from Bill Sweeney and Bruce Klein. In the third period, with barely over nine minutes left in the game, Bartlett again scored with assists from Sweeney and Klein. Less than a minute later, Bartlett scored his third goal of the game with another assist from Sweeney. Finally, with 38 seconds left on the clock, Bartlett took another pass from Bill Sweeney for his fourth goal of the game. The fans were absolutely delighted watching Bartlett do his little victory dance three times in the last 10 minutes of play. Although Jimmy was a beloved hero at home, in every other city, he was absolutely hated as the ultimate heel. On a game that took place in Cleveland on February 28th, a group of fans created anti-Jimmy Bartlett paper caricatures, signs, and cartoons and hung them behind the one goal. The signs were so offensive, when Terry Reardon complained to the general manager of Cleveland, the GM immediately agreed and said that such a practice was not permitted in the arena and ordered the police to remove all of the offensive signs. One of the toughest guys to ever put on a Reds uniform was their beloved former captain Chuck Scherzer. Chuck played for the Reds from 1945 until 1954, the year before Jimmy got there. After leaving the Reds, Chuck Scherza became the player coach for a senior league team called the North Bay Trappers. However, during the 1957-58 season, tragedy struck. During a game, Scherza was struck in the face by a stick, which caused him to lose his left eye. On March 5, 1958, the Providence Reds hosted a huge event to benefit Chuck Scherza. The main event of the night was an exhibition game between the Providence Reds and Chuck's North Bay Trappers. To the amusement of the fans in attendance, another exhibition game was part of the benefit, with teams consisting primarily of the wives of the Providence Reds players, including Jimmy's new wife, Helen. According to the press, the hilarity of this game matched Groucho Marx, Bob Hope, and Danny Thomas at their best. The weirdest event of the night was an accuracy contest made up of Jimmy Bartlett of the Reds going against Angelo Santilli, a professional golfer, and Major League pitcher Max Sercant. As part of the competition, Jimmy had to shoot a puck all the way down the ice into a cage, and the golfer had to do the same with his putter and ball. The pitcher merely had to throw the ball into the cage. In the first round, Jimmy was three for three in his attempts, while the professional golfer and major league pitcher were only two for five. After the golfer was eliminated, the baseball pitcher was able to defeat Bartlett in the overtime round. It didn't matter who won, it was all for fun and everybody had a great time. The loyal fans of Providence showed their love and devotion to the team and really displayed Providence pride as they raised thousands of dollars to help their injured hockey hero. 
On March 9th, 1958, another one of Providence's favorite former players was injured. Playing against the Cleveland Barons in the third period, Providence's Ted Hansen fired a blast at close range against Johnny Bauer. Bauer stopped the initial shot, but Jimmy Bartlett, racing in at top speed, arrived at the goal mouth in order to catch the rebound at the same time that Johnny Bauer reached out with his stick and attempted his famous poke check against Bartlett. A huge collision occurred with both Bauer and Bartlett going down with one of Jimmy's boots hitting Johnny Bauer on his right side. Johnny had to leave the game with three broken ribs. For the first time since Jimmy came to Providence, his team did not come in first place during the regular season. Despite missing the first month of the season due to the flu and tonsillitis, Jimmy still finished the year with 25 goals in only 59 games. In the first round of the playoffs, the Reds faced the Hershey Bears who finished the league in first place. Hershey's offense was led by the great Willie Marshall and left winger Dunk Fisher, who finished first and second in scoring that year. On defense, Hershey had player coach Frank Mathers, and the dangerous Larry Zydell, who has been described as being one of the dirtiest players in the history of professional hockey, who infamously engaged in a violent stick-swinging duel with Boston's Eddie Shack, leaving both players bleeding in 1967. A contributing factor to Zydell's violent reputation was due to the fact that being Jewish, he was often subjected to anti-Semitic comments during his playing career. Sadly, after his death in 2016, it was determined by Boston University that he had suffered from chronic traumatic encephalopathy that was caused by his more than 100 concussions he received during his career. That contributed to his debilitating headaches, acute temper, and odd behavior. The Hershey Bears won the first game of the playoffs against Providence 3-1. The only goal by Providence was one scored by Jimmy shorthanded against Bobby Perot, who he had faked out with a deke on a one-on-one breakaway. In game two of the playoffs, with 25 seconds left before the end of the game, the Hershey Bears broke a 1-1 tie to take a 2-0 lead in the series. Just like in game one, the lone Providence goal was also scored by Jimmy Bartlett. The Reds lost a heartbreaker in Game 3 at home 7-6, with Hershey Bears player Ed Stankiewicz scoring the winning goal with only two seconds left on the clock. Bartlett never scored in this game, but did engage in a lively fight against Hershey winger Les Duff. With their backs against the wall and facing elimination in Game 4, Marcel Paille and Bobby Perot engaged in a goalie duel until Providence's Paul Larravee scored the game's only goal in the third period. Earlier in the game, Jimmy and Les Duff of Hershey were both penalized following a fight in which both players swung their sticks violently at each other. Returning to Hershey for Game 5, the Bears easily eliminated Providence from the playoffs 6-3 and eventually won the Calder Cup after beating Springfield in the finals. At the end of the season, the New York Rangers informed the Providence Reds that they were switching their affiliation with the Buffalo Bisons for the next season. Showing up for training camp the next year, Jimmy did everything in his power to prove to Phil Watson that he was ready for the big time and did not want to be sent to Buffalo. Jimmy showed up at training camp in shape and played as hard and energetic as Phil Watson had expected. And Fiery Phil kept his promise to Jimmy Bartlett that he made three years earlier when he poached him from the Montreal Canadiens. Jimmy Bartlett was going to start the 1958-59 season with the New York Rangers. Bartlett was going to Broadway.